Thank you, Randy. I love that section. I love the book. Uh, I love its uh, playfulness. And we'll come back to talk a little bit more about Sam Candy, the protagonist of Beggar's Feast, in, in a few minutes, and about the novel itself. But I thought it might be nice if we began with uh, a few personal uh, questions and lines of interrogation. We had the pleasure of traveling together, Randy and I, in Sri Lanka to go to a literary festival in Gaul uh, in the south of Sri Lanka earlier this year. But I thought that you might like to hear and Randy could explain. Um, perhaps we could begin, since you were born and raised in Oshawa, tell us a bit about your parents. Where did they come from and when did they come to Canada and how did that work? How did you come to be born in Oshawa and grow up there? Oh, Oshawa is actually a little known place in the middle of Sri Lanka. It's, just, it's a double name. <laughs> it worked out very well. Uh, my, my parents came, immigrated from from Sri Lanka to Canada in the late 60s. My father came first in 1967 and uh, was a graduate student at the University of Ottawa studying chemistry there. And from there, he became a teacher and got a job in Oshawa. And then my, and then my mom came over in 1972, and they were married and started a life in Oshawa and you know, sort of been there ever since. And I was, uh, I was born in 1976 in Oshawa and, and grew up there. Do you have siblings? Yes, two, two sisters. Oh, I see. Um, and all of you have read more pages of my fiction than they have combined. <laughs> <laughs> Even if you've never heard of me, it's true. But <laughs> so, um, uh, Oshawa, and I hear you're a Leafs fan, is that correct? I, well, I, I would have, at some point in my life, certainly, certainly been a Leaf fan, but it's, it's not an easy thing to be these days or these decades, so. <laughs> now, did you go to uh, schools, like public schools in Oshawa? Or did I went, you I went to Sir Robert Love Catholic School. Um, for elementary school, and then I went to, to high school, and some of my Oshawa friends are here. In fact, they're the ones in the muscle shirts in the front row. Uh, <laughs> and then I went to the University of Toronto for an undergraduate degree in English. And then from there, I went to graduate school in Boston. I did a, an MA and a PhD at Boston University, where I met my lovely wife, who likes Michael Andachi more than me, and uh, sort of proceeded from there. You were in Boston for seven or so years, if I remember. I was there for six years, yes. Yeah. Um, so when did your sort of first passion for writing begin to emerge, and what other interests did you have, say, in, in public school and junior high school and high school growing up as a boy in Oshawa, besides perhaps writing? Well, my, my hockey career as a defenseman lasted about three practices <laughs> and, and maybe one exhibition game, and it didn't go much further than that. Um, but I, you know, I was, a, I, was a, I think, a, an enthusiastic reader uh, and tried to be a writer from, I think, a very, very young age. Um, but also at the same time, you know, I think I was always interested in ideas more broadly and in, in kind of culture and public life and politics. And so all of that was always, uh, I think, probably in the mix for me growing up and what we would think of now perhaps as, as the life of the mind or, or, or an engaged intellectual life, probably from a very young age, uh, was, was something that was, that was compelling for me. Do you remember when you first wrote creatively something that you just did because you wanted to as opposed to being required to for school? Yeah, grade six, Tina Pella. I wrote her an acrostic poem that told her how <laughs> I liked her using her name, and the, the teacher found it before she did. <laughs> what about fiction? When did you first Well, that was fiction as well, <laughs> in, in its own way. <laughs> Uh, I, well, I think, again, I, I remember actually when I was 14 sending a 52-page story to Toronto Life that I had written, and it was called Seasons, and it was four <laughs> different seasons. And like Vivaldi. Each, yeah, and each one, each one had its own theme. One was cold, one was hot, and so anyway, at the age of, at the age of 14, I sent this to Toronto Life. I haven't heard back yet, but I'm... <laughs> I'm still now, holding that out. now that you're so much better known that you never know. That you never right. know, exactly. Found documents or something. Seasons, that's pretty good. And you mentioned that your first stories were published with Descant. Well, I published uh, a couple of stories with, with magazines that no longer exist. Right. And those, you know, those classic ones that are at the bottom of the, the racks at Chapters and in Indigo that no one ever reads but everyone wants to be published in. Um, and then the, the first kind of real short story I would say I published was, yeah, it was in Descant magazine a few years ago. Now, all the things you juggle, you're a university professor of American literature, you're a novelist, you've written uh, a lot of nonfiction, uh, you're an essayist, a reviewer, you're even now the vice president of Penn Canada. Um, do you find sort of that you feed off the adrenaline of all this kind of activity? Uh, do, you, do you find that that just creates a kind of an energy in itself that helps you go and keeps you writing? I think, yeah, I think so. I think I've always naturally kind of been drawn in multiple ways at the same time, and, I, and the, when things are integrated properly, the one is always sort of feeding the other in, in all the right ways. 
and you know, my wife has observed many times whenever I've kind of you know, had some sotto voce moment and I, I wish, I wish my, my, my novel became a movie and therefore I could just retire from everything and devote myself to writing for the rest of my life, that I would in fact be miserable and would have nothing to do with myself because you know, I'd be done writing by 7 o'clock in the morning. And that's a long day ahead of me of self-Googling. So. <laughs> well, there's... There's something to be said for being kept busy and yes. for sort of having that stimulation of, of being busy. But um, do you write uh, various projects simultaneously? Like, might you be working on a work of nonfiction and a novel at the same time, or a review, or a critical essay as well as a work of fiction at yeah, the same time? Yeah, I'm always I'm always honestly working on three or four different writing projects at the same time. I would say. And so uh, that can be stimulating. Actually, I remember yeah. working on the book Negroes in a in a nonfiction book at the same time, and I it the actually turned me on. Yeah, yeah, turned me on. It, it, I fed one sort of led into the other, even though they were very different books. And what's what's nice about being doing both at the same time is the one. If you think if you take the Deserter's Tale and the book of Negroes as an example, they're so radically different that you can kind of move back and forth between these these two really different worlds, and the the connections that that emerge are are far more compelling because they're more natural than than otherwise. And so writing a novel about, about Sri Lanka while researching the life of a neoconservative Catholic priest, again, it's, it's a, they're so wildly different that when I do find things in common, it, it can be very, very stimulating. Yeah. Well, and unless you're researching, um, it's hard to spend too many hours a day writing the same thing. Oh, exactly. Um, exactly. So you, you can only get so many hours doing that. Now, family life, of course, helps with that, as you, as you well know as well, Larry. That well, you become you really more efficient in budgeting your time and using the time you've got. Exactly, exactly. <laughs> and I think, but you're using it by indulging in sleep deprivation, which I, I know about, too, from especially some earlier books. But you were mentioning to me that uh, to write The Beggar's Feast, you were getting up at four to write before going off to teach at Ryerson. Yes, and I know that I have colleagues in the audience, so, so just plug yours for one moment. But I used to sleep on my desk at Ryerson in the afternoons. <laughs> um, your tax dollars at work, everyone. <laughs> but I would take a little nap on my desk in the afternoons because if I'd got up at four in the morning, by two o'clock I was exhausted. But I would take a ten minute nap and then get back to work. Now I understand. I had a computer science prof at university who would sleep under his desk. And if you went in to consult him, you'd find him sleeping under his desk. And I thought at the time he was crazy, but now I understand. He was probably writing novels in the morning. <laughs> exactly, exactly. <laughs> now about fiction and nonfiction, I mean, there's, I found in my own life as I've similar to you, worked in, in both areas, uh, although fiction in my case turns me on more. I, I wouldn't ever say that for me that it's easier, but it just turns me on more and it sustains me for a longer period of time. Mm -hmm. Is there a form of writing that for you really grabs you and holds you and, more, and you feel more passionate about than another form of writing? Or are you sort of unable to answer that the same way one wouldn't declare a ch one child to be a favorite? No, no, no. Uh, second child is the favorite currently. No, it's a, it's a joke. <laughs> um, you know, when it's really going, there is nothing, as you know, like writing fiction, I would say. Like, when, when you're really on, when you're in the moment, you know, when, I mean, a baseball analogy be, would be when, or even a hockey analogy, when a, goalie, when a goalie talks about a puck looking like a soccer ball, or a beach ball even, right? Or, or when a baseball player is on a hitting streak and just tearing balls out of the park and every single one looks like a beach ball coming at him. When you have that kind of feeling for, for, for writing, and it happened a few times at Beggar's Feast, certainly, uh, there is nothing like that. Yeah, it's almost as if um, when you're at when you're on stride and you're really going forward in an exhilarating way, it's almost impossible to be in a bad mood that day. Well, exactly, exactly. Yeah, exactly. It can be maddening you, for the people around you. You either come downstairs or come upstairs, and they can tell that, that it's been a good writing day. But honestly, I mean, I would just say there, there's you know, wandering around a, a resort in Sri Lanka with Larry at a literary festival is a very nice thing but it doesn't compare to the feeling of, of writing fiction when you're really on, right? Like, all the goods of, all the goods, I mean, you're a lovely man, and we had a great time together, but I just mean, <laughs> all of the goods of, all, you know, the glamour of publishing and things are fun and enjoyable, and, but when you're actually creating something, and you know you're doing, a, you're doing what you're supposed to be doing, what you're called to be doing, yeah. there's nothing better than that. Well, there's writing, and then there's sort of being a writer yes. like in a, as a public figure. And the right. two, there's so different things. Mm -hmm. in, the, in a way, it's a bit crazy because when you start to write, it's not as if the job description includes speaking publicly. Right. You know, exactly. when you start to write, you're driven to express yourself and to create, put something down on the page, and you're not thinking about what you're going to look at, the, like at the podium right. four years later when the thing's out. Well, and I think that would be one of the dividing lines between people who would want to be writers and people who would want to write. The person who wants to be a writer likes the idea of going to the fancy party and, and eating unpronounceable foods, but 
probably doesn't want to get up early in the morning and just sit down with a blank screen in front of them. Yeah. And you were mentioning to me in conversation the other day that um, you think that Virginia Woolf might have done a disservice to aspiring writers by talking about a room of one's own. Why is that? Yeah, I think that that's, that's a... It's an, unfortunate, it's an unfortunate analogy that she had that, you know, a writer, specifically, of course, a, a woman needs a room of, of one's own in order to write. And I think what's wrong with that is in, who has that? Who can have that, right? And so what is the result? The result is you always have built in a reason why you can't be a writer. Well, if only I had a room of my own, then I'd write the perfect novel. Well, no, that's not true. If you're going to write a great book, you're going to write a great book in any way, shape, or form. And in fact, in another one of um, Virginia Woolf's no uh, novels, Orlando, there's another character who's represented as clearly the alternative approach. And uh, I, f I forget his name suddenly, but, but the point is, he's, he's, a, he's a grubby moneymaker. He's desperate to stay on top of things. He's, He's, he's riding with, with, like, with children and diapers surrounding him. And anywhere, you know, he just kind of makes space on a crowded table and keeps on working. And he's working in part to make money and in part because he has to. And it just strikes me that that's a far more realistic account of what it means to be a writer than this idea of going off into this turret with, with, with Celestial Springs tea and waiting for the spirit to come down upon you. I remember when I was uh, working on my first novel, I came across an interview with Anthony Burgess, and some person had asked uh, the British novelist uh, what advice he had for aspiring writers. And I think he came up with the greatest line. He said, you have to learn to write in conditions of chaos. Yes. And uh, it was great, because when you think of it, there are all sorts of wonderful books that have produced, been produced in the most hideous circumstances. <laughs> yes. Prisoners in jail, right. you know, writing books, or um, you know, Joseph Heller going to a job uh, you know, in advertising in the day and hating it, coming home and writing Catch-22 at night, uh, probably in, in Faulkner the wrote one of his early novels while working as a janitor at the University of Mississippi. He was the university's worst janitor in the history of the whole <laughs> school because he never cleaned a thing, but would just sit down in the boiler room and work while he was supposed to be emptying toilets and such. Um, let's turn to Sri Lanka for a minute, if, if we could, mm -hmm. since it uh, uh, forms obviously the backdrop of your novel, Beggar's Feast. Um, and we had the pleasure of traveling there uh, earlier this year. Your, an opinion piece that you wrote recently for the Toronto Star so suggested that Sri Lanka needs a new story, mm -hmm. uh, having emerged from this hideous, long, a vicious civil war. Uh, you were concerned that readers of that piece would assume that you were sort of for one side yeah. of the former combatants or another. And I guess I'd like to ask you, what are the dangers of obsessing over the question, whose side are you on? And how do we move past that sort of in post-Civil War Sri Lanka? Well, I, I, mean, I speak explicitly as a novelist rather than a policy analyst or a politician, of course. And as, as, a, you know, as, a, as a concerned observer about life in Sri Lanka for, for any number of obvious reasons. But I think probably the story that we know here in Canada of Sri Lanka is a story of very strict binaries, right? Uh, the, uh, the Tamil minority, the Sinhalese majority, the Tamil Tigers, the Sri Lankan army, the whole country is organized in these kind of strict binaries. But one of the things that I discovered in the, in the course of writing this book is just how cosmopolitan and, and wonderful and, and pluralist the history of Sri Lanka is, and the reality of Sri Lanka today remains altogether pluralist, as opposed to strictly, uh, strictly collapsed into these binaries. And so, uh, to my mind, the, the, the way out is, is, is to kind of just be willing to imagine a place that more correctly reflects many of its realities without denying, of course, the deep historical wounds of that, of that primary conflict. And in Canada and in Sri Lanka, do you feel that when you write about Sri Lanka or when you speak publicly about it or write publicly about it, say, as a journalist, um, that you're being pushed by others into sort of being on one side or another? People are sort of demanding of you to identify yourself positionally? Yeah, I've, you know, I've done a, I've made a great effort, I think, to kind of avoid being absorbed that way because I think a writer loses, loses his or her voice when, when, it's, when, their, when their commitments are so straightforwardly, you know, a, yeah. a novelist in service of a political position is not a good novelist, <laughs> right? And my vocation is as a novelist. And so in speaking in those terms, uh, I've, I've, I've certainly resisted. I've also resisted forums where this could happen, where you could sort of be pulled into one camp or another. Um, you know, the, what's the flip side of that? The flip side of that is a certain amount of, of I would suggest, perhaps moral cowardice, right? I'm outside everything. I, I don't want to, I, I'm just the observer. I'm just the observer. I'm not implicated in anything. And that's certainly a challenge that, I, that I've struggled with. But again, I, I have no illusions about, about, about what I'm writing is somehow going to change 
the, na the nature of, of our understanding of Sri Lanka. What I hope was it'll just maybe enlarge our imaginations a little more about the place.